Hello, welcome to my latest video. This video is about Ike Turner, the wonderful, innovative R&B and blues performer who wrote the first rock and roll song back in the 1950s. He produced some great music. He was very influential, not always a very nice chap, but we'll come to that. And this is about my attempt to get Ike Turner to play at the Rhythm Festival in 2006 and subsequent years. And this is exactly what happened. And I'll tell you after this introduction. Here it comes. Right, Ike Turner. Rolling, 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 rolling. To put this into context, back in 2004 and 2005, I was going around Britain looking for a site to run a rock festival. And I chose a site in Bedfordshire called Twinwood Arena, which was holding the Glen Miller Festival. And that's where we're going to hold it. So we organized it. The first one was going to be in August of 2008 and six and so i set about finding acts for it well what i wanted it to be was a whole range of acts in the type of music i used to put on at the 100 club where i used to do shows which includes like ska reggae blues r b rock music folk even a bit of jazz um, comedy singer songwriters with the emphasis in the classic like getting people who were names who'd been around a bit because I found that a lot of these older acts especially at the time were still quite fresh they were 1960s and earlier acts and they were still not that old in 2005 2006 so I booked a lot of I got Roy Harper to do a special show with Jimmy Page, Donovan, I got other people, and one of the people I was after was Ike Turner. For those who don't know, Ike Turner really started rock and roll. He was a multi-instrumentalist. He could play every instrument just about. He started off at the age of, I think, eight, playing piano with one of the big blues giants. Well, when he was 18, a band he was with at school basically produced the first ever rock and roll record, which was credited to Jackie Brinson and the Kings of Rhythm. But it was actually Ike Turner, who I believe wrote it, and who was responsible for the arrangement and the whole music of it. So anyway, he goes way back there. Um, he's played with just about every blues and soul name. He was responsible for the Ike and Tina Turner Soul Review and lots more. If you want to know more about Ike Turner, there's lots of information out there. So anyway, back in 2005, I approached Ike Turner. He was working on an, an album. He just got, got out of prison. And so I contacted him via his agent or manager um, who I won't name because there might be some legal ramifications about all this. So just to say at this stage, all this is a bit hazy because I was trying to organise a music festival which involves so many things you would not believe. Maybe one day I will do a video about all the things you have to do to get a festival off the ground. And the acts, booking the acts is one of the least strenuous well at least that's what i thought but booking ike turner proved to be a bit of a challenge so i contacted his manager in the states and and so we agreed that we would do a show i think on the saturday at the rhythm festival and then i would do a show in london the following week we already had jerry lee lewis headlining the sunday and he was going to do a um, week of shows for me in britain and so that was, I think I was arranging all this at the same time. So it's all quite um, important. There's a lot of money changing hands about this because um, I had to send him some money before he'd even talked to me, this guy. So anyway, I sent him the money. I think it was 5,000 pounds. Basically, it all started to go wrong because I was doing lots of other things, but this kept never getting there. And the guy I was dealing with kept picking an argument with me. That's what I thought. Because every time we did something, he wanted me to do something else. Like, oh yes, that's fine, but now you have to do something else. And when I got a bit shirty from time to time, which I did after a while, because I was constantly sending them money over, and not just them, but I was sending money to Jerry Lewis's people, all sorts of people I was sending money to, and yet, with Ike Turner, nothing seemed to actually happen. It turned out he was working on a show with Gorillaz about the same time. 
as he was talking to me. But anyway, what, what happened in the end was he didn't appear. I think I sent them something like 15,000 pounds. And in the end, they found a reason not to come. Now, I think we arranged to do the festival and various dates. I'd send them 15,000 pounds, I think it was. Rhythm Festival and then a tour. And then a show, I think, at the Shepherd's Bush Empire, because I already had Jerry Lee Lewis ending up at Shepherd's Bush Empire on the Saturday night, and I seen him, but it's going to be the Friday night. So anyway, he never actually came. There's a bit of animosity. It turns out, in retrospect, when I look at all the things, that he was ill, for very, quite ill then, and he was breathing with the help of oxygen, and he couldn't really go very far. But... There was no mention of this. The festival went ahead and I lost some money, but it was very promising. Everybody seemed to like it. So I was going to do the, another one and I started to book out to the next one. And I did, I don't know what happened, but the manager guy got back onto me and said, look, you know, we've had our differences. Let's, let's do this fight for the future. Let's do next year's festival if you're going ahead. I could really wants to do it, etc." So anyway, then what started was we started this thing where um, they were courting me in effect because I'd already sent them quite a lot of money for nothing. They started to say that, um, for what I can recall again, it's all very hazy, that we had to start again. That was all in the past. That was for a previous show. And I think this lawyer guy tried to um, blind me with we look like American law, but as I pointed out, the festival was taking place in the UK. So anyway, I think eventually we agreed I'd pay him another £10,000, I think it was, or dollars it might have been, but I think £10,000, it might have been 15000 It was quite a lot, but again, I was going to make back my money, because you've got to bear in mind, I was heavily into this. It had cost me a lot of money, the previous festival. I think I got some of it back from the Jerry Lee Lewis tour, because I think at the final show, they paid me enough money so I could pay the security for the festival, which was quite a good thing to do. Because let me tell you this, you definitely want to pay your security people, definitely. We again got into sort of like various legal things and they said I hadn't done things. And so what happened was, Ike Turner actually rang me up out of the blue one day. And he was very charming and he was very nice. And we had a chat and I was quite in awe of him because Ike Turner, no matter what you hear about, what, no matter what the Tina Turner story says, whatever, he is still a musical or was still a musical legend. Well, he's still a musical legend. He may, may be dead, but what he's done will, will not die. And so I'm speaking to Ike Turner, of all people, and it was quite a long call. I'm seeing him over, it's like half an hour on a Saturday afternoon, because for some reason he used to ring me on Saturdays in the afternoon, um, which was not the normal time for these sort of things. Bear in mind, this was all in the run of the festival. So this was all like probably May, June, even July time, I think. And this is the year after. And he basically talked me back into it. And he was talking about things he wanted to do and all that. And we talked about a lot of things. I'd published a book for the Do Not Press, which I was in, which I set up in the 1990s by a guy called John Collis who was like an old Time Out and Radio Times journalist who wrote a book for me, which we put out as a little hardback, called Ike Turner, King of Rhythm, which is now one of the reference books which people, which is on all the encyclopedia pages, like Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica as a reference. It's been out of print for years. I'm not even sure why I still have one. It was a very good book. A lot of people liked it, I'll say that, and um, he liked it, this is the thing. He found out that it was me who did, did it. So we talked about that for a while. And then eventually it all went bad again. I don't know what happened again, but don't forget, I had lots of other things going on at the same time. And then the strangest thing happened, because one Saturday afternoon, maybe, he said maybe six weeks after all this had gone wrong, it stopped ringing me and the manager basically told me I was in breach or whatever. So we had this big thing. I was getting legal advice about how to reclaim all this money at centre, which I seem to recall was something like 35,000 pounds, but it might not be that much. I think it might be 35,000 dollars, which is about 25, 26,000 pounds, something like that back then, hard to say now. So anyway, out of the blue, one Saturday afternoon, I was at my desk and the phone rang and I picked up the phone and there appeared to be no one there. There's, I could hear things happening in the background and there's like somebody banging things, like, um, I don't know, like bits of wood and things. And then it's like a guy started to do some chanting and things and there were bells ringing and there was stuff going on, the guy shouting and all that. 
And I was thinking, and I had no idea what was going on. And, it's, and I'm not sure even how long it went on, but I, li but I listened to all these guys, fascinated by what was going on. And anyway, in, and, and it just went. And so it just... Up, up. And so it took me a while, but I think I'm pretty sure that was a voodoo curse because apparently, it's very weird, even though it says on his Wikipedia page he was born a Baptist and converted to Judaism, I have spoken to two people since who told me that he was quite into voodoo and things in New Orleans, because apparently he lived in New Orleans for a little while and he got into it there. And I think that he tried to get to get me cursed with a voodoo curse. Now, which does tie in, because if you know anything about voodoo and cursing people, if you curse somebody wrongly, then that curse will bounce back on you. And that's one of the fundamental things of witchcraft and all these other things. And so he died, I think, four or five months after the fair festival where he didn't appear. So I wonder if that had anything to do with it, because he was supposed to, because his death was a very strange thing, because I've looked into it. And even though he was like an, a former cocaine addict who um, kicked it, it, and he had embassy money, he was like quite ill towards the end, and he couldn't really get out of bed, and all the musicians in the band went around to his house to try and play music to get him interested in the music again. Because he was um, quite old, 70, 76, I think, something like that. And so, um, and he had had a very hard life, let's not, let's not forget that. So, and apparently he died of a cocaine overdose, anyway, which seems pretty unlikely to me. So anyway, that's my running with Act Turner. It's um, a bit sad, it's a bit mysterious, but at least I had a chance to talk to him and it was like, well, it was, it certainly, it certainly cost me enough to talk to Ike Turner. If you like this, please like it down below and uh, please subscribe. This channel now is having no writing stuff. If you want my writing stuff, there's a separate channel for that, Jim Driver Writes, please do a search. I think there'll be a link in my description. Um, and I'll see you next time for some more rock and roll stories or whatever else we're going to do. Goodbye and thank you for watching.